How is everybody doing? Am I supposed to talk in this? Okay. Thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy October schedules to be part of our Need to Know event today. Uh, today, we are very lucky to have Deborah Bolton, Director of Intercultural Learning and Academic Success, and Laverne Bitsy Baldwin, Director of the Multicultural Engineering Program. And this is part of our Need to Know series because we think this is really, really important information that you can use in your teaching, your learning, and your advising. So please help me welcome Deborah Laverne. Thank you. Okay, we always want to start off our uh, presentations, no matter what they are, with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that this gathering on the ancestral lands of the Ka Nation in Kansas with its four tribes, the Iowa Nation of Kansas and Nebraska, Kickapoo Nation, Prairie Band, Potawatomi, and the Sac and Fox Nations. We remember because they still remember. Oh, move on. I see how it's just pop over here. Oh, <laughs> so here's the title of our topic, Remembering Our Histories and Building Relationships Across Human Difference. We did this title because here's something I hear a lot, and that is we have to talk about inclusion and dealing with diversity. So in my language, in my head, I'm going, aren't we talking about remembering our histories? Because we really can't talk about inclusion until we start talking about the history of exclusion. And why don't we talk about building relationships rather than dealing with diversity? And what is diversity anyway? So we're going to go through that because there's this concept that diversity is the other and not everyone I see in front of me. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. So first, we're going to introduce ourselves. So, good afternoon. Laverne Bitsy Baldwin in Shia, Kia Ani in Shlu, Tuaruch Eatni Bushishin, Tohatcha New Mexico Dan. That's my formal introduction in Navajo or Diné, um, which is our uh, us in our language. Diné Navajo is the English word for our tribe. Um, but what I told you is my name is Laverne Bitsy Baldwin. I'm of the Towering House people and the Bitterwater people and that I'm from Tohatchi, New Mexico. So if any of you were Navajo, you would know if you were related to me. <laughs> so that's who I am. But what I do is I'm director for the Multicultural Engineering Program. Been uh, here at K-State for 15 years now in that position and in Manhattan, gosh, 20 plus years. Well, Laverne brings, I'm, I'm going to say one more thing about you. If you think about the history, when, when Laverne talks about the word Navajo, if, in case you don't know this, Spain made it to what is now the United States way before the Plymouth Rock landing. And so Castilian was a language. And the word Navajo meant people of the planted fields. And so they take back their name, the people, uh, in Diné. Mm -hmm. and, and just so, before we go. Oh, yep. Yeah. Um, that was a picture of me and my younger sister and my older brother. But that's, that's a little glimpse of how we grew up uh, in the mountains near um, in Tohatchi. It's, it's the beginning of the Rocky Mountain it's right there. If and you're ever in Santa Fe and you wonder the wonderful smell, it's the pinion pine. Were you out gathering pinions oh, nuts sure. that day? Oh, yeah. yeah that's like it. <laughs> um, in 2015, we also uh, founded, and I'm co-chair for the Indigenous faculty staff here at Gay State. Of which I'm part of, so I get to work with her in that sense. Ya'ate, she a Dr. Deborah J. Bolton, Yinishie Okiawenge, Dine, and Ancompagre. That just, I just introduced you to my, uh, and told you what my ancestry was. So I align, um, I'm enrolled in the Okiawinge, but my maternal grandfather is Diné. So I have to put all of those lineage. My father is Ute, that's Uncompagre. Um, so I'm National Geographic Explorer. I, I just got, see I have a compass right here. I was just awarded Geography Educator of the Year by the Kansas Geographic Alliance and the Kansas Council for History Education and the Kansas Council for the Social Studies. So I just got that wonderful, this is my compass rose. And um, I am the Director of Intercultural Learning and Academic Success. 
I'm a National Geographic Explorer, and my uh, area of focus for research is multilingual populations, mainly in Southwest Kansas, focusing on health, well-being, and social connectedness. Today, this is our structure of what we're going to talk about today. Attitudes, behaviors, and connections. Yep. So what we're going to ask you to do is periodically we'll ask you to check in with a neighbor or somebody around you um, to, to kind of think about what you've seen that's uh, an attitude that is out there, some different behaviors that you've recognized, and then connections that you've made to your own work um, or any kinds of connections you want to, to share with your neighbor. So we'll have you check in every now and then with us. But if you looked at our learning goals, does that actually change? It does. I always do that. <laughs> anyway, um, so I want you to look. Sorry about the snark. I want you to look at the learning goals for today. And as I'm working, that's going to show up on the stream, isn't it? <laughs> Um, as we work with students across the campus, and I talk about understanding that all humans have a cultural identity, because I'll tell you a little bit of some of the language I hear when I ask students, what's your culture? And bless their hearts, a lot of times I hear, I don't really have a culture, I'm just a normal American. And I don't unpack that, but I hear it a lot, and it only tells me we've never had to some people have never had to think about what that culture is. So we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit. But we also want to talk about the language we use and model and operationalize how that can sometimes make or break whether your, students, your student is successful in your classroom or not. Because remember, the whole reason they're here is so that we can send them off out into the world with a degree and it just makes Kansas State University look better when our students are successful. So we're gonna talk about um, how history plays a critical role in why we talk about inclusion today uh, versus what's the opposite of inclusion? Exclusion, exactly. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that um, as well as come back around to just a comment about why we do the land acknowledgement in this sense too. And again, I talk about in, uh, diversity, including all people, because it's not just those people, it's all of us. And I'm just amazed that it clicks over. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh -huh. Okay, we're gonna start talking about that first topic of the language we use. No, we're going history, right? Oh, here it is. There we go. Cultural identities. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when we talk about taking stock, um, I'm part of a, uh, the Kansas Council for the Social Studies, and just in the social studies curriculum, one of the very first words is our founding fathers. So if I was sitting in that class, which I have sat in that class before, when they talk about our founding fathers creating what we now know of as the United States based on Christian principles and individualism and the rights of man, I'm thinking, hmm, I can't identify with any of those. Laverne and I are both from matrilineal uh, cultures where the women are the head. And you may have noticed when we had Indigenous Peoples Day, who spoke at our Indigenous Peoples Day? It was women and they were strong women. They were the leaders of their communities. And so we really have an honor about women, but we function in a patrilineal society. But we want to bring it also back to you as educators because you in the classroom are the dominant identity within the classroom. And so helping you to kind of unpack and understand a little bit more about what, uh, I, how impactful those identities are that you carry with you and um, how those are seen by all students in different ways is pretty important to how well you come across in the classroom. And we were talking about the, the founding being on a meritocracy, which was meant to differentiate among men. So it had to do with men more than women in that meritocracy. Do you wanna talk about the student coming to talk? Okay, so um, a lot of times, this is the difference between um, 
your representation of who you are in the classroom and how you, in the sense, use language, how you uh, look at history, how you look at um, connections to inclusion, uh, makes a difference to this last question. Well, why didn't the student come and talk to me? Well, they may not have made a connection or, or they may have, they made a, may have made a huge connection. So it's, it's the difference between um, honoring the, mm -hmm. the leader and that they wouldn't come to you because they are the, the inferior for lack of a better term. I mean, a lot of them, a lot, of, I worked with Asian populations a lot in Southwest Kansas and teachers were only next to the emperor in their points of view. So um, if they invited me to dinner and I was 15 minutes late, they waited. They were not about to start the, the meal, even if it was a potluck without that teacher, that leader. So there's that, that wields a lot of power. And we have to remember that when we have students, mainly from individualistic or collective societies, as opposed to an individualistic society, which the US is the, the main, is that we're a, founded on individualism. And we're both from collective societies, as are a lot of the students in our classrooms. So I want to stop here for a minute before I flip to the next slide and just have you share with me one word from your culture about you, about your cultural identity. And remember, our cultural identities can be a lot of things. I know we have a motorcycle rider in here. That's part of a cultural identity, right, Dr. Zacharias? <laughs> we can call that a cultural identity because He's going to have a common language and a common belief with fellow motorcycle riders, right? So think of it in that way too. And then we talk about our objective culture. If maybe if you were to look at me today, one of my objective cultural signs is that I'm a geographer. I have a compass rose on. Um, and maybe you'd notice the, the turquoise earrings. And so those are the objects that we can see when we talk about culture. But probably the most difficult are those subjective cultures, our belief systems, what we value, um, all those kinds of things. Learning styles is part of that. That would certainly be something to know about your students, learning styles. We'll talk about modalities in the classroom in a little bit. So shout out. I'll shut up now. Lost words. <laughs> it could. Wasp, yes. <laughs> could. Certainly. Male, lots of things. Others. Thank you. I saw someone say, I don't know. You haven't had to think about it, have you? But some people think about it every day. Think about this, you know, knitters have a culture. They have a language. You know, you, dropping a stitch or, you know. Pearl on, pearl off. Right. Is that right. one of them? <laughs> I'm guessing. I don't knit. So <laughs> row. But but it's definitely, you know, part of a culture that you're connected to. Quilters have a culture as well. You know, they've got their own specific tools. Quilter, we have a quilter here. Yes. Tell us one word in your quilting culture that maybe we don't know. How about a fat boy? What is a fat boy? Qu oh, a quarter. <laughs> See, I don't know the language. <laughs> a fat quarter. <laughs> Appalachian. Thank you. All right. Music, folk arts, those kinds of things. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, how about this side of the room again? Wrestling. 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 Real wrestling. Like, <laughs> what is real wrestling as opposed to phony wrestling? Oh, you mean like the kind where they stamp when they're trying to? Okay. Oh, the non-theater, not WWF. I got you. Oh, okay. that, that, I couldn't remember that. Kind of sounds popular. Okay, wrestling. <laughs> Tell us a word from wrestling that we may not know. Uh, Take down. Sprawl. 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 Okay. Anybody else? What? Half. Half. Oh, those are 
<laughs> like the half Nelson. Mm. Hey, my brothers were wrestlers. Anybody else? Hot, hot dish, hot, hot dish, hot dish versus casserole. Okay, it's not a casserole. <laughs> hot dish. Okay, that's something you eat. But in a, a younger context, it might be a good-looking woman. <laughs> <laughs> Potluck, there's a word. <laughs> so remember that everyone walks into the room with all these different identities, and you can tap into those elements of people and pull them in uh, to what you're teaching them. Yeah. And uh, professors, academia, that's a cultural yes. uh, identity, a discipline. So, language that we use and uh, model and operationalize really works uh, for us or it works against us. You want to pick that up? So it's, it's not about political correctness. It's definitely not. It's, it's about how other people understand you and internalize the language that you use and the words you choose each day in representing what you're teaching. And so as I've been interacting with a lot of people, I've worked for Kansas State University for 14 years now, and, I've, and so I've been writing down language that I've heard over these 14 years that make me stop and think. And of course, I, I shared one with you about I don't have a culture, I'm a normal American. Not What would a normal American look like? Can you help me with that? Okay, good. <laughs> good. I was hoping no one would say anything. Um, I, about nine months ago, I heard uh, somebody say this. Traditionally multicultural, and he was referring to multicultural being students of color and other marginalized identities, but mostly I think he was talking about students of color, don't seek higher education. And so I remember standing up saying, I don't want anyone leaving this room and thinking that multicultural people don't seek, traditionally don't seek higher education. The tradition is that we've mostly been excluded from higher education. So with that long history in mind, any of your students with any of those marginalized identities might come to you feeling like, I'm not sure I belong here. And maybe he or she or they have even heard that before. Um, <laughs> Another thing that's been said, oh, she's the diversity hire. Like, like I have no brain or the person that is the diversity hire. Oh, here's another one I've heard. Hey, can you be on this selection committee? I need a female and a minority. <laughs> and what does that, what does that right say? Now. I don't have a brain. That's all I have to offer. And so, you know, you have to unpack these things. Uh, you're, you're different. You're not like those people. You're not like those other Indians. You're different. <laughs> okay. One of, them, one of them, the last one I, I like, oh, they have issues. We have priorities, but they have issues. Yeah. And so understanding that, that when you use some words, they're negative connotation versus, oh, how would you talk about yourself? Uh, you have priorities, right? Other people have issues. So, so, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Please. So, so using that language in, in in an inclusive way, how would you say things about oh yeah yourself? What's a priority that you haven't understood in another person? Good question. That, that you might call an issue. I don't understand the question. Okay, um, and I think what uh, Laverne was talking about is. In our interactions, someone who, who behaves different, it will be called an issue. When um, if that same behavior in a dominant population might be called a priority and the behavior is the same. So what, so yeah. like I don't personally hold this belief, but like maybe like the idea that like some people are like vegetarian by choice and some people are vegetarian by like religion. So like. Yeah. Seeing vegetarians like a choice or priority, whereas like that is, you know, their need for their religion. It's still their priority and their choice, but 
we might see that, like some people might see that differently, you know what I mean? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, very good, very good. It is a tough concept to unpack. That, I think that's what we're demonstrating, isn't yeah, it? I, I, uh, my, like, in early elementary, 12, 10, like, that's what I Yes, right. thank you. And it doesn't say that the, the kids that need movement didn't have an interest in learning. They may have been kinesthetic learners. So it's a different way of learning. I was that student that couldn't sit still, <laughs> you know, and those yes. kinds of things. Go, go ahead, oh, no, did no, I interrupt no. you? No, 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 just, this is good because um, we got to make sure that the Zoom can hear oh. a little bit of what the answers are too. So can you hear that very well on the Zoom? Can you tell if they can hear? You're not sure. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, that's we'll, a good we'll, idea. We'll do that from now on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, and yes. I came in this conversation yes. very late, so I'm not even sure I'm going to be too late. But as a faculty member who does community engagement, we hear people in our education work say this is a problem. You hear that word, it's, it's a, a problem. problem, or that person is a problem. And a lot of times that's not the right word either, that there may be an issue, that's a different thing, or a challenge, which is a totally different thing than to use the word problem. So when we think about issues, this doesn't just apply with our one-on-one -on -one conversation or in group, but in larger community groups and dealing with interacting with people where we as a university go out to communities and label the concerns they have as problems or issues. And I was also thinking in the classroom, you were talking about the younger student. Um, and uh, I think sometimes they've been called, oh, she's always sneaky, uh, seeking attention. But we might consider she might be seeking a connection rather than attention. And so just sometimes in how we use those words, and I, I wanna make this last point about international. We, I've talked to a lot of students, they talk about the international students, those students, those international students. They're from, but if you think of others as international and the US as not international, then we're pretty ethnocentric, aren't we? And it says to me that the US is the center of the world, of the globe, and everyone else is international. And if we start to believe and see ourselves as part of that international picture and that human difference uh, continuum, then we begin to see ourselves among people rather than in a different place from other people. I think when we use the word outsourcing, we're, we're sending ourselves out or we're sending something out there, but we don't understand that yeah, that we are part of that international connection. Yeah. Yep. There we go. So language. Language is huge. And language is another thing about uh, the reflect on the adverse effects of bias. Is this where we want them to talk? Can't remember. Okay. I think so. <laughs> so yeah. we're trying. Oh, why don't we check in now? Yeah. Have you heard any attitudes, beliefs, and what's the C stand connections. for? Connections here? Yeah. So, what have you heard of our attitudes? Well, the attitude that the United States is the center of the world. Yeah, <laughs> is that, is that the right it's, yeah it's an attitude, not necessarily a fact, right? Yeah, an okay. attitude that the that the U.S. is the center of the world. Yes, okay, that is an attitude. Any other attitudes? Uh, on top of that, that everyone wants to be here. In um, my class, we often talk about immigration and when mm -hmm. the Yeah, that attitude that everybody wants to be here and immigrate here. And if we open our borders, yes, that everybody will come. And of course, yes. I love being here. I love it, you know, but it's interesting that we're not one of the top five happiest countries 
in the world. <laughs> and people, want, everyone wants to be here? No, I think a lot of them want to be in those happy countries too. Yes. Yeah, the attitudes that like people with different priorities are an issue. Uh, the attitude with people with different priorities are an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any others? Oh, yes. Right, the attitude of nationalism, that I'm an American and I don't have any other identity beyond being American. Perhaps I don't need another identity. Okay, okay. interesting. Woo, yes. this could turn this political real fast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're moving on now. <laughs> so going back to this, um, remembering our histories and building relationships across human difference, when that term that we built this upon was Let's talk about inclusion and dealing with diversity. How would we deal with, the, with diversity as anything that's different, right? Oh. Hopefully. But, okay. Okay. Okay, we can go. Okay, we can go. And, and so then when we talk about the history of exclusion, um, I worked in extension for a long time. Extension was kind of built, well, let's start with the Land-Grant Act. July of 1862, Abe Lincoln signs in the Morrill Act to create the Land-Grant. That same year, he also did the Homestead Act. So what did the Homestead Act do? It gave plots of land to people who identified as Christian so that it excluded the people who were here, who by 1862, we weren't considered uh, human yet, we didn't get the right to be human until 1873. If you want to learn more about that, you look up t uh, Standing Bear. Standing Bear. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I, have a, I have a joke. about. Anyway, um, sorry. No, it wasn't a joke. It was a bizarro that Standing Bear is signing a, a thing that he's getting... Anyway, what was that? <laughs> I'm going to get myself in trouble. Okay, and then, of course, the, all of this, uh, the, the, not only was the, the Homestead Act, the Land Grant Act, and the Agricultural Experiment Station Act, and then the uh, 1890s Act to bring the traditional and uh, historically Negro colleges in, and then 1914, jump ahead to the Smith-Lieber Act for uh, extension to create, to continue to build up a population because we wanted to establish that the population that we were giving land to would be the strongest and individualistic, so standing out. And so we were talking about the halls of academia <laughs> and addressing and the halls of academia. The literal hallways of academia <laughs> and looking at Just the rows hall. and rows of white men on so many different walls and I think the Chronicle actually had an article recently about rethinking uh, the, the walls with uh, rows of white men uh, facing out to all of our students especially as the demographics in our country change and how we want to encourage more people to be coming to our institutions. Oh so. I forgot to talk about 1990s with tribal control bringing brought the uh, traditionally native colleges being brought under the uh, land, uh, land Grant Act and uh, it was called protection but it was a way to control and all of that is written up especially as land grabs continued to happen the government would they'd sign a treaty bring in the land as protection and then that protection would go away um, so I think I was going to say something about Kansas State University remember February of 1863 what did we start out with? 100 students, 50 men, 50 women. So we not only were the first land grant officially, but we were co-ed, mm -hmm. which was really cool. So they were teaching the men how to be better producers on their land, teaching the women how to be better wives. And <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, but we were a little ahead of time, our time in that we had co-educational, so we had a, a good basis. And then of course, we were also ahead of our time. We were sending out community educators before 1914, as early as 1906 here at Kent State University, and what we call extension agents today. And I always loved that because we were a little ahead of our time. So that does mean we do know how to change. We are dynamic, and hopefully we are making headway in the classroom and serving students that are not part of the predominantly white uh, population in this predominantly white institution. 
I, I will give a shout out, shout out to K-State uh, on one more element is that, you know, most land grants were, you know, well, if we go back up to 1890s, we're then going to include our, our black students, anybody, you know, not white students. A lot of universities, a lot of states chose to separate their institutions. So if you look at Texas, uh, their land grant institution is Texas A&M. Yeah. Yeah. And so there they have a sister campus, Prairie View A&M. And that's how they understood and, and included uh, our non-white students. But K-State did not break into two universities. Those students were um, in classes. They were not completely included. We will say that. <laughs> but they were, we did not create a separate institution in the state of Kansas for our non-white students. When do we stop? Three, okay. Oh, good. We're fine. We're yeah, doing we're well. Okay. Um, I will say about Kansas State University, it didn't, it wouldn't educate George Washington Carver when he, he was accepted to school and then he got here and, oh, no, we can't accept. So he went to Iowa, which, you know, that's good. But if you go into the Danforth Chapel, you walk right in, look to your right when you're walking in, and you'll see George Washington Carver in the stained glass there. So I forgive us. <laughs> it's really cool to see him there. Okay, you ready? Um, I have, we have one more point. Oh, I'm our, sorry. So you can leave it for a second. Okay, back um, up. I don't know. No, 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 you're good. That was it. No, was that it? That was still the right Oh, slide. it was? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one of the things we want to, you know, go beyond is to now, since we have integrated schools, we're already, you know, we're, we've moved further. Um, consider that social, educational, and economic constructs uh, at times still favor the dominant population and so understanding that whatever we use the words fair oh that's not fair to everybody else that sometimes that that's very short-sighted in terms of thinking about or using that word with our students um, if we're trying to help them to get past a barrier and so making sure that um, <laughs> that we understand what what it really means to be fair versus, well, I guess, better, equitable. Yeah. And so, again, back to language, back to exclusion and uh, versus inclusion. We have to remember our past to make sure that we are moving towards, um, towards, towards the new history that we want to create. Have you ever seen that little, it's, uh, it talks about equality, and so they have the same, uh, people are looking over a fence. They're all on the same size of bench. That's equality. But when we talk about equitable, then we would make those uh, little benches that they're standing on to look over the fence a little bit different. So someone like me could actually see what's going on on the other side of the fence. So my box might have to be a little taller than someone else's box who's 6'1", right? So that one is equitable. The other is equality, equal. So even though we, we tended to use that word equal as if it was when we talked about equal access to, um, to school, there, there it makes sense. We want equal access to school and education. But equitable is that when we're there to, uh, and we're not whining or anything, we just want it to be equitable so that I can function well in a classroom or someone like me, the same as my... Um, uh, uh, my classmate, mm -hmm. who might be from another, from the dominant population. Are we there? Go. Okay, so I think the last Connect. element that we're going to cover is making connections. So um, a lot of times, well, we know that you're all from some very, very different backgrounds. I see architecture, I see ag, I see, you know, people from all over campus, all different grade levels. Um, and so we're not going to tell you how to teach the classes that you teach, but hopefully we're giving you some, some elements to consider as you create the elements that you're going to teach. Um, one of the things that always gets to me in the, in the textbooks is that a lot of times there's a boxed off segment, right, that is an extra thing for you to read. 
that is just kind of kind of cool, right? Um, a lot of times we won't go into those those things in depth, or we won't even come back and talk to talk about them again. Um, it's those generally are have to do with um, kind of the edges of populate of the majority population. So that's why we call them marginalized, right? So uh, those identities or, or elements are from the edges of the, of the main population. Um, one of the points that we want to make definitely is that you come back around, you circle back around to those elements, that you, uh, they're not just kind of glossed over, they're not the exception, but when you come back to it, evaluation means you value it and that you're going to hold the students accountable for that. And so... I want to encourage that as you go through in teaching what you're going to teach, that those elements that are in those boxed off sections, you can you highlight them, but you also evaluate them. It makes a difference in the thinking of the student and what they're going to come back to. Okay. Thank you. I um well, can we just stop for a moment and can you each tell us your name and what you study or what you teach or your discipline? Then we can go quickly, but I still want to know who's in the room. Alex Redcorn, Department of Educational Leadership. Mary Ellen Barkley, Career Center. Andy Barkley, I'm in Agricultural Economics. Ashley McCowan, Hospitality Management. LaBarbara Wickfall, and I'm in Architecture and Planning. Hannah Shear, Agricultural Economics. Luke Matulowitz, Academic Achievement Center. Uh, Laura Molinax, Graduate Assistant in the Academic Achievement Center. April Darnell, English Language Program. David Allington, I'm a retired professor in dance and I'm now an academic advisor for sociology, anthropology, and social work. Victor Andrews, PhD student, kinesiology. Arabella Andrews, graduate student, college student development, and education counselor on Fort Riley. Michaela Rader, geology. All right. Uh, Nick Bartz, biology. Libby Wilson, biology. My name is Sam. I'm also in biology. I'm Pretty Bardesman in chemistry. I'm Chris Brazil. I'm a TA from industrial engineering. I'm Jeff Sakrakas. I'm in adult learning and leadership. I am Tucker Jones. I'm with the Teaching and Learning Center in the Department of Psychological Sciences. I'm Don Sauce here, also from Psychological Sciences in the Teaching and Learning Center. I'm Eric Dutter. I work in uh, ISO. I'm an application developer one. Good, thank you. Karen Savallos, College, College of Education. Did you speak? Okay. Andy Faber, Modern Languages. I'm Rasha Kiani. I'm a PhD student in political science and I teach world politics. I'm assuming Kim in Family Studies and Human Services. Nilo Fulkamitani, College of Education. Laura Starr, Agronomy. Catherine Stewart, Agronomy. And in the Zoom world, have they, can anyone there say who they are? Like they could put it in the chat box? Okay. <laughs> Um, Brooke Berger. Yes. Uh, Matt Program at KSU. Okay. That's all? Okay. Thanks. So then the point there was that each of you have, oh, here you go. That each of you, oh yeah, I have one. Um, that each of you have a discipline and that each of you are going to have students come to you from different backgrounds than you, different disciplines. Maybe they're in your class, but they, maybe they're in your English class, but are studying biology 
Maybe they're in your biology class and you're studying English. So we all bring these different identities into the classroom with us. And maybe you don't have time to explore each and every one of those when you have three or 400 students in your class. But you, uh, it's just good to recognize that they will come to you with different uh, things that happened to them that day, uh, different uh, backgrounds, different reasons for being there, different abilities to be there in terms of finances and, and support, family support. But there are all these different things that our students bring to us while they're sitting in that classroom and it's hard for us to know. Um, that's where I first met Dr. Zacharakis because I lived, I worked in adult education for 12 years and that's where I fell in love with multiculturalism, all cultures, because we had a lot of different students. And the area that I study has uh, anywhere from 24 to 36 languages and dialects. Well, unpacking all that in research is really, really fascinating. and. But I also re realized they don't all come with the same set of needs and wants and backgrounds. And so um, we're not going to be everything to everyone. <laughs> and so what we invite you to do on one of our bullets is bring people in that have a connection to your discipline, but may have a different point of view that may have a different voice, that may have different experiences than you have, or that may have experiences that, you know, that resonate with, if you survey some of your students, experiences that they have that would help draw them into, into the discipline. So um, we love coming to speak <laughs> in different places. I mean, we're not the only ones, but um, definitely, uh, one of the things I do as an example is I go to the College of Veterinarian Studies, which I'm going to do next week, and talk about um, a veterinarian in a Native American community. And so we talk about different taboos that have to do with animals, about how um, in my culture uh, the sheep herder is treated with so much respect and um, you have to make sure you know who's the person that takes care of that animal? You know, a lot of times the, the veterinarian will talk to the dude, <laughs> but it's probably the woman <laughs> who is the sheep herder or who is, who is the tender uh, that takes care of the animals. And so you got to know who your audience is when you're doing that. Um, and so having my voice to come in and talk about those experiences that uh, come from my community is helpful in, in that respect to help veterinarians learn a little bit more about cultural diversity and where they're going to be working. And I always like to talk about the, indivi the uh, individualistic society uh, and interacting with someone from a collective society. There are just different things. When you're in a collective society, it's all of the people benefit from whatever. Uh, when you're an individualistic society, you stand out, you get your picture in the halls of academia, you have a statue made about, I mean, and I, I realize I'm just really generalizing that, but an individualistic society requires us to stand out, work hard, and be noticed and recognized where we might uh, not, not want to be, not want to stand out and be noticed in a, in a collective society necessarily. Mm -hmm. And you will have students from those different uh, disciplines or those different backgrounds. Assessment and learning. I don't know. Oh, me either. <laughs> I have no notes on this. Okay, oh, okay. I think I put that up there because we talked about modalities because we will have students with different, we talked about that already about students with different ways of learning. And of course, that culture is a different way, if a different culture is different ways of knowing how we get our information. And so that's why I put the, uh, if you judge a fish by its uh, ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. That's been attributed to Albert Einstein, but I think there's some debate on that. So I didn't attribute it to him. I think people say something for so long, we just forget who said it, or if someone did. <laughs> so anyway, why are we talking about this? Growth in the United States. So the Census Bureau, the World Bank, several people who study these sorts of things said, say that we will, the U.S. will not be a majority. There won't be one majority. By 2040, some say 2050. So that means we'll be a pretty 
pluralistic society. I suspect, however, that there will be a dominant culture that still sets the laws and what is normal in the land but will be a pretty uh, mixed society. I don't know that we'll actually be pluralistic. That would say that we all had equal uh, say in things. Um, and that goes way back. But that's why we talk about this. We're changing. We've been changing for a long time. Oftentimes we, we think this is the height of the change. We've never had more immigrants than what we have now. But if you look at uh, charts, uh, probably highest immigration, other than the founding of the US was probably 1870s to 1910, had the highest percentage of foreign born people in what is now the United States. And in the 70s, where many of us grew up, that was the very lowest point. We were like at, uh, it was like 10%, 5%, it was very, 5%, it was very low. And now it's climbing back up, but we have not reached the percentage that we were in uh, 1870 to 1910. But it just looks different because of the people that grew up in the 70s thinking, oh, we've never had more immigrants than we do now. So this is what the world's gonna look like, or be, it does look like. And beyond, beyond you know, any ethnic identities, we, we have so many other identities, so many other cultures, uh, and so many things that are becoming you know, the way now. And so, for instance, in uh, housing and dining, all the name tags have pronouns on them now. Uh, my student advisory board, we have our pronouns on our name tags because that's an important element uh, that we want to put out there. And it is, it is normal. It is not out of the norm anymore. And so making sure that, you know, all those elements get represented when we are in front of people, <laughs> um, we could do that on the first day even, you know. She, her, hers, right here. I like the way you said that, normal. So mm -hmm. really what we're talking about is normalizing difference. That it's just different, it's not less. As Temple Grandin says, I'm different, I'm not less. And so that's normalizing what you see is different. So we want to ask you, do you have any recommendations uh, for your, your uh, colleagues here about what you might want to do to make sure that all of your students feel like they belong in your classroom, they feel like you're, you're, uh, you have an interest in them. You wanna share, anybody have any recommendations? We left that blank intentionally, yes. Let's, let, let's get the microphone up to you so our Zoom students can hear. Yeah, so like I teach world politics and often I just find it hard because a lot of time like the issues we are dealing with and I'll just come to that part. But I think like one way since like I am a first generation student. So when I started school, like probably here or like when I'm from Pakistan, I never knew like, you know, how, what does the office hours mean? So a lot of time I still feel like, oh, okay, maybe I'm just going there. Maybe I'm, I would be bothering like my advisor or professor. So like because of the the power structure thing within the like and coming from Asian society. So I think one way I address this is like I do the mandatory meetings with my student like like twice a semester. So it, because like like in my class, it's quite a diverse class. Like there are people, they're first generation student, they have racial, their sexual identities. I mean like people, they are they, they show like different backgrounds there. So I think that really helps them to connect with me. And I also have like the group discussions where they're kind of connecting with each other too. And I think that really matters a lot in terms of like building connections because I think it makes students very comfortable. Like if you just, if you get connected with them, like they're much easy and like they feel more comfortable or like in, in talking about issues that probably they would be reluctant to talk about. But like, I don't know, I have a question. I, can I go ahead and ask right now? Yes. So, and that is related to how you address like a lot of time, like when you talk about diversity, I think there are some challenges too. So like being teaching the world politics in the class, I know we talk about like LGBTQI, we talk about like abortion issues. And I know like in one of the classes I was talking about this because like it's about women rights and all these things. And one of my students in the class, he asked me, I belong to a religious group like that 
that says like, oh, there should not be abortion, right? And all that stuff. So first, like he was asking me, would you please tell us what do you think about this issue? Like, should it be, I know like it's legalized, but in this political spectrum, we are seeing like there are a lot of changes being made. So, and they ask like my opinion as an instructor, right? Because like you, you, they put you there and then they ask you, okay, how would you, a lot of time you just want to get away with these things because you don't want to show like, you know, political views and all these things, but just because talking about women rights and all these things. So I, 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 I just talked to them like, this is the way I think it should be done. And because on like the way the history, like the women, they have been discrimination and like the bodies, I mean, like you just put them in a perspective. So it, it doesn't only show the political side to it. But then they were like, okay, then how you address the religious side? Because based on my beliefs, because I'm a Christian, or I mean, like regardless of you're Muslim or like Jew or like based on if you're practicing religious, as I say, it forbids it. So how you accommodate these two different things? And honestly, I mean, it just puts you, I mean, as an instructor, I mean, I was like, I respect your opinion, what you are saying. But the question is how you just like address it in a way like that doesn't feel like, and he says like, no, in this even like current scenario, like there's a big pushback for this, that put, that makes us feel like we are excluded from the system. So I don't know, like if you are an instructor, I, I'm just curious to know, any, anybody can jump in. If you are put in, in that situation, I don't know, how would you, are you, do you think is there a best way to, I mean, except that like telling student, you come to my office and I can talk to you more about it. But they want to know your opinion and they want to know like how you like address these challenges. And I think like sometimes, and talking about issues like LGBTQ, and since I teach world politics, and these are all the issues that come up in the class and this student, they want to know like, or they take your opinion very seriously and because like this is the way they try to approach things. And of course, by not taking a political positions on that. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody have some feedback? Shukriya. Anybody have any feedback? How do you how do you interact with a question like that from I your think students? I always in in my classes I'm, I talk with my students from day one about respect and being respectful of other people and other people's beliefs and cultures and all that. And I think that that's what it comes down to is that you have to say like you know I respect everybody's beliefs, but your beliefs cannot trump somebody else's identity, autonomy. And I think that's what it comes down to is that, and I say that in my classes to my students is that everybody's allowed to have whatever opinion they want, but you cannot be disrespectful to other people. You cannot um, make them feel bad about who they are, their identity, that kind of thing. And so I think that couching it in that way by saying, look, like I 100%, uh, you know, I understand why you believe that. Um, and I can support that and you can support that without saying, uh, you know, and say, but a woman still deserves her own rights. She, you can, your religious beliefs cannot dictate what someone else does with their life. Good, good discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Here, let's, let's get a microphone to you. Technically, we're supposed to be, supposed to be founded on the idea of separation of church and state. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think some problems come into that because we base a lot of our, I feel like, um, political choices on our morals, and our morals are strongly dependent upon what we believe as through politics, through religion, our interactions with other people. So you can talk about the separation that's supposed to be there, but understanding that people are still going to have those... Um, influences on their decisions regardless of how separate they're supposed to be i mean that probably doesn't answer the question fully but in the united states we're supposed to have that separation so yeah <laughs> yeah it does it does any yes <laughs> uh, we have uh two minutes left in our class before i get chased uh, out. i just want to uh caution folks to be careful with the use of the word but uh, and when you're, when you're saying to a class, I believe, I, I respect everyone's opinion and we should all respect each other's opinions, it's better to say, and we are not here to change anyone else, yeah. as opposed to saying, but linguistically, as well as in therapy, if, if I say, I love you, mom, but I can't stand it when you act like this in a therapy session, you just <laughs> negate it, I love you, mom. But if you say, I love you, mom, and I don't like it when you act like this, it's, it just sounds, it, it's more compassionate way to, to speak. The other thing I wanted to talk about was gratitude for correction. If somebody says to me, that's not my pronoun, thank you. Thank you for telling me that because I don't want to screw that up. If I, if I say something that you were offended by, if I, I, I 
was in dance when I was a professor, and it's very common, particularly 20 or 30 years ago, to refer to a group of grown women as girls. All right, girls, we'll start at the bar. Girls, you need to get your hair up. And uh, I learned that that offended someone, and I realized, you know, that, that, that's one too many people for me. So thank you. Thank you for telling me that it offends you when I say girls, even though that's the, the world in which I grew up. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yeah, one of the one of the things I want to end on is kind of what we started out with in terms of language, because this is kind of where we're we're coming to as well. Is that it's not again, it's not political correctness. Correctness. It's really understanding the people in your classes. Yeah, it's understanding and valuing the people in your courses. So we'll go. I didn't have a picture of of Laverne to put up for questions. <laughs> I'm not a trophy hunter either. Um, <laughs> hunt for meat. No, but I am the hunter. So, you know, because a lot of people think they'll ask my husband, oh, are we eating your venison? He goes, no, she's the hunter. So anyway, those assumptions. We're really close to the end of our time. Yes. And, I and wanna... if you have any questions, could yeah. you? or you can just email us, find us. Mm -hmm. But um, I just want to make sure that you all got to see that you have an invitation in your hand. <laughs> to come and hear uh, Joy Harjo and actually see her perform. She's not gonna speak. She's gonna perform. She is the poet, US Poet Laureate for the United States and she'll be here on Tuesday, March 24th, 2020 in the Alumni Ballroom from 5.30 to 7. So please put this on your calendar. This is another window to our world. Um, and we're, we're happy to invite you to save the date for that. Thank you for inviting us, Dr. Saucier. Appreciate it. Just a couple of housekeeping things. If you didn't sign in when you came in, please do that for now. If you're doing this as part of the Teaching and Learning Center Professional Development,